Hello, I'm Daniel Chua. I'm a professor in the Department of Music here. It's great to welcome all of you here this afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome the world-renowned cellist, Stephen Isselis. Um, I'd like to open the door as wide as possible so that people have access to understanding music, the wonderful world of music. And another way in which you can actually access music in this way is by buying this book, which Stephen has written with none other than Robert Schumann. Uh, Robert Schumann's Advice to Young Musicians, revisited by Stephen Isselis. And it's a great book about how to give uh, lots of good advice, basically, on being a young uh, musician. Robert Schumann, of course, was a pianist. So I think if he had a choice, he would have put a piano on here. But I think you put the back of your, is it your back of your Strad on this? Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a nice cello on there. So, um, and unfortunately, uh, Robert Schumann can't be with us today to sign the book. Uh, <laughs> But if you buy the book and CDs, I'm sure Stephen will sign them after the concert uh, this afternoon. So Stephen, maybe you, we could begin by talking about why you come, came to sort of revisit this particular book and your attraction to Schumann and, and this particular sort of guide to young musicians. Well, the book actually has its roots in Hong Kong, strangely, because I, I've done two big tours with the Asian Youth Orchestra. And they were doing a documentary, the film crew was doing a documentary about the AYO, and they said, what would you be your main advice for these young musicians? And I started talking, and then I sort of decided I'd elaborate on it a bit, so I wrote for my official Facebook page, I wrote an article about what my main advice would be to these particular young musicians, and all young musicians, and I couldn't believe the response. I mean, it's like a thousand people responded to it, and... Um, so I started to think, hmm, young musicians are hungry for advice. And since I do give classes around the world when I travel, and I can see some very lost souls there whose teachers are just not advising. They have no idea what music's about and what it is to be a musician. Um, and around the same time, for some reason, I can't remember why, I started rereading Schumann's advice to young musicians, which I'd read before. And... I thought, this is old-fashioned, but actually the truth is still the truth. And it very much applies to, to musicians today. And music lovers also, I think, would be interested in it. You don't have to be a musician. So I decided to bring it up to date with a more modern translation. I don't speak German, but, but it's very obvious what he's getting at from all the translations. So I put it in a slightly more colloquial English, modern English. And then I wrote... As much more by me than those by Schumann. In fact, I'd say 75% at least is by me. I wrote a sort of an interpretation of it for what it means for us today and what, he's, what he means, in my opinion. And then I wrote some advice of my own, and that's the book. I mean, I know you love Schumann's music a lot. I love One it. of your favorites. So, it did you is. feel being anybody a... with any taste or any culture <laughs> loves Schumann? You know I have difficulties with Schumann, but anyway. Mm. Um, Doesn't speak well for your character. I know, I know. Mm. <laughs> but at least I was honest with you. But mm. the, the, So you, having you know, loved Schumann's music so much, did you find when you were reading his guide to young musicians that so somehow it kind of chimed in with your view of musicianship? And well, yes. I mean, it's obviously what he says is the truth. Right. I mean, it's, <laughs> it was written, what, early, first half of the 19th century. So obviously some things have changed. But music is music. Right. So were there any favorite bits from Schumann's guide that you really you thought, wow, I must really pick this up and share it? Um, yeah, some things like when he says, as you grow older, uh, communicate more with scores than with virtuosi. That's his way of putting it. And what I think I'm sure he means there, and it's even more relevant today, well, he wouldn't have, he would have what it means to us today is don't learn your interpretations from recordings. Go to the score, go to the composer. Um, you know, it's very dangerous now. It's much more dangerous than it was in his time. Then they would just go to concerts. But now, of course, you have YouTube, you have everything, you have videos, recordings. It's so easy to be influenced. I mean, I try and make a rule unless it's a complicated contemporary score. If I'm learning a piece, I don't listen to anybody playing it. It's, um, it's nice, like, for instance, I just 
learn the Kabalevsky cello sonata, which we talked about last night, fantastic piece. Um, and I've never heard anybody else play it, and that's the way I like it. Right, so just be. you and the score, basically. You and the composer. Yeah. yeah, amazing. But, you know, there is a lot of advice in this book by Schumann and yourself about not emulating, you know, mm. these kind of showy, I guess that's the right word, kind of showy musicians, virtuosi. Well, any musician, no matter how great. You know, I mean, I'd love to listen to Casal's recordings, obviously not of the Kabalevsky Sonata, because I'm sure he never came anywhere near it. But, um, you know, I love listening to my two favorite cellists, Casals and Shafran and things, but I shouldn't listen to them playing pieces I'm going to play. Right, but there's something about trying to get to the heart of what makes a musician, right? Not sort of yeah. imitating. I, I wonder whether you could speak a little bit more about that. What is the real thing? And how would you help a young musician be more authentic in that sense? Well, when I teach, it's mostly about what has the composer written? How would you play that differently if he hadn't written that? Um, you know, a composer writes a long slur. Obviously, you can't, as this is obviously for string players particularly, but you can't do endless slurs because you run out of bow. But then I say, okay, you don't have to do it in one bow. That's obviously not what he means, but there's a message there. What is the message? You know, in every marking, like we're doing today, sonatas by Fauré and Franck, neither of whom write that many instructions in their music, but every one they write means something. It's a message, and you have to see why did he write that. You can't ignore any of these messages. And also you, I mean, just picking up on that, you're very interested also in kind of authenticity in performance itself and looking at you know, playing sort of uh, with earlier instruments or people that play early instruments with you. Yes, yeah. although so, I don't go against my instincts. I don't right. like... So this is the interesting question about... Uh, the how, I mean, you know, you can be very informed by the score, also by the context, the historical context, but how far would you go with the information as a musician? Well, you wouldn't go against your instincts. I say everything must sound natural. I can't stand going to concerts where the... You know, the, the musician has read one or two books or bits of one or two books or thinks he's, he or she has read one or two books and they show you just how much they understand about the Baroque style. Um, <laughs> it just sounds stupid to me. It sounds like a lecture recital. It has to be your truth. But mostly when you read these books, really, actually they're just telling you to phrase beautifully, to understand the harmonies and things. I've just been reading C.P. Bach's. Um, essay on the true art of keyboard yes. playing because I was recording C.P. Bach concerto. And as I say, basically, you know, a good musician through the ages has, he's phrased, he's understood harmony, he's understood form. That hasn't changed. Right. On the other hand, there are things, you know, when in, the, for the instance, the rhythm of Baroque things, obviously sometimes they don't write double dots, but they mean it. And that you have to learn. Yes, I mean, being a musicologist, obviously, there's a kind of difference, I think, between, say, writing a history and writing a historical fiction. And in one sense, when you're performing, it's a little bit more imagination has to, and as you say, yourself has to go into that, right? You know, you're not sort of constrained by... Yeah, I mean, you know, it's limited. The, yeah. the notes don't mean quite what they say, the words don't mean quite what they say, but as I say, they're messages. Um, but of course, you, know, you have to interpret them. Right, right. Well, that's the exciting thing, right? Each, each musician interprets it slightly differently, but it's a sort of communication Very between them. Yes, indeed. And there's also quite a bit in the book. In fact, the book begins and ends really with a kind of plea for passion and love of music. There's a, there's a quote, I think, on page nine from, from Schumann here that talks about enthusiasm. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. nothing great can be achieved in art without enthusiasm, and you write, yes, what's the point in even trying to be a musician if you don't love, 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 love music with all your heart? So obviously, it's something that's very passionate to you, and actually, the end of your book, when you give your own bits of advice, you also talk about the need for, for this passion and love of music. I mean, it, of course, it kind of goes without saying that it should be there, but quite often, actually, you know, musicians do lose that passion. I mean, yeah. have you, I know you haven't, but you know, have you seen it? Uh, oh, have, many, many what, times. It, yeah. You know, you see people famous, especially famous people, come out and just do the, the, the performance they've done endlessly. And they're thinking more of the applause at the end than they are of the music itself. Um, and there's a sort of cynicism there that I hate. And no, I haven't lost it yet. Oh, that's good. It would be terrible. <laughs> I mean, it would be like a, a priest losing their belief in God, yeah. be, which, you know, it happens, it happens and, yes. and they tend to commit suicide. But that hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> It's so dramatic about this. But um, th there is, I mean, I I'm thinking of the Hong Kong case where there are many uh, young musicians that 
play, but they don't necessarily love music. They just have to do it, um, partly to get into schools and stuff. I mean, I mean, but they do have a kind of musicality there. I mean, what would your advice be then when the, uh, uh, someone is in that kind of situation? Well, I'd say, first of all, change teachers, because it's up to, <laughs> up to the teacher. Well, change to parents. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's a little more complicated. Because um, it's up to the teacher to nurture love of music. I think any child loves music. Any mm. little two-year-old, you play them a nice tune with good rhythm and they'll be thrilled. Yeah. Um, and you just, and in fact, it's the first... Well, what I, it wasn't Schumann's first paragraph, but I put it at the beginning that, you know, that everybody is born with a certain feeling for music, he says, in his own way. Um, and then it's up to the teachers to nurture that and make sure it doesn't go, to make music fun. And I say something about, you know, if you've had, if you've had um, let me see, a teacher who rapped you on the knuckles when you played wrong notes, don't let that put you off music just because... Miss Smith was an old sourpuss doesn't mean that's not Beethoven's fault and right. it's not yours because you're you know, de depriving yourself of music um, which can be the best thing in life um, yeah I mean it's, it's terrible when people are just groomed to play competitions and to impress and yes. as you say to get into schools that's awful and what can one do yeah You'd call social services. <laughs> I think so. Well, they can come and hear you play and be inspired. Maybe that's the best way. No, might yes. put them off for life. <laughs> <laughs> One of the pieces of advice that I find very interesting. Uh, b back to those scores again. Is that you advocated? And I think coming from Schumann, uh, returning to scores, um, even if you know the piece from memory. Yeah. You know, even if you've learned this piece, you know, you know, like the back of your hand. Somehow, you must always go back and have a look at this music. Just quick question: How well do you know the back of your hand? Could you describe oh, it? Oh no, well, you couldn't. You know. It's such a funny expression, that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got to know the score a hell of a lot better than you're likely to know the back of your hand. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You know, I know all these pieces from memory, but when I go back, and I'm sure, unless you have a completely photographic memory. I'm surprised. Oh, yes, the accent's on that note, not that note. There's a slur there, there's a piano there. You've always forgotten something. And also, it can be sort of inspiring, the visual, the visual side of a piece. And, of course, it's lovely to play off a manuscript. When I, pl when I work on the Bach Suites, it's always from Anna Magda, or usually from Anna Magdalena Bach's manuscript. It inspires you to yeah, it's play more squeaky. It looks beautiful, yeah. <laughs> Aesthetically more challenging. But I think... Um, you know, there's a related to scores, and something that Schumann talks about a lot is that, this, in a way, when you are away from your instruments, away from your fingers, as it were, it actually does more for your imagination, as your creative imagination, as a musician. I think there's a there's some comment by Schumann that says, you know, you should really um, not know the piece of music by your fingers, right? Uh, but you should really be able to hum it. Uh, yes. So that you're away from your own instrument, as it were. So you have a kind of more yeah. defamiliarized feel with that piece. Absolutely. I mean, what, what's well, that about? That's because, as a player, it's likely that your fingers will go for the most comfortable option, and they can lead the interpretation. It shouldn't be. I say, you know, you should be in control of your fingers, not the other way around. Even though there are ten of them and only one of you, <laughs> but still, you should be, you should be in control, and it should be from here or here straight through to the, the music without them sort of telling you how to play because that's what's comfortable. It's true. I remember talking to a violinist once who said something like, actually, if you have to play a note and you put your finger down and you play the note, that's what's you, what, what you're going to produce. But actually, you should not play that note. You should hear it first. How would you imagine that note so that yeah. you're not controlled, as it were, by your finger, yeah. uh, even in producing a sound? Right? That, that imagination has to be there. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of musicians tend to just to want to just get down to practicing this thing <laughs> and hopefully they'll produce something that sounds like that piece of music. I'm not being very inspired by the prospects of the young musicians you know from all your descriptions. Well, you know. <laughs> I'm sure there are many better young musicians than the ones you're describing. Well, yes, of course. I mean, the Asian Youth Orchestra, that's, that's a lovely group. I love that mm. group. They are so eager to learn. Um, it's just, you know, they're just full of this love of music, this love of... Uh, it's really... That's why I did these two big tours with them. It was... It was so nice to have that, that every day, no matter how tired we were, they'd be there wanting to learn, wanting to be told about 
phrasing and music and right. things. That was well, great. No, it's great that it inspired you to, to write this particular mm. book. And also, I have to say that you've also written other books. Uh, I have for children. For children, That's right? So there, there is something in your heart that wants <laughs> to communicate to the younger generation. I guess so, music, yeah. Which I think is lovely. Well, I suppose it's all to do with my son when he was little. He, he wanted to know about the composers, so I started writing a book. And then they got published, and then the publishers asked for a second book. And eventually I said yes. And then... I don't know. I think part of the reason I enjoyed the Asian Youth Orchestra tour so much was partly because of these lovely young people, but also because my son was with me for both tours, and he had such a good time with them as well. All right. So you can sort of thank him. Yes, OK, we'll, we'll do that afterwards. Um, so uh, your, pro your programme today actually is a, is a very interesting a program, and, and there, there will be some pieces there that most of us would not have heard. Uh, I doubt if anybody here has heard the first piece. Han. I'd never heard it, yeah. Right, and then there's a, a new piece for us anyway for, for, by Tom Adders. Um, there is a comment um, in, in the Schumann book about uh, you should never dismiss a piece on first hearing. Yes, yeah, Schumann uh, says that. Yeah, ne yes, you should never mm. dismiss a piece on, on first, first hearing. I was wondering whether you yourself have ever... Uh, dismissed a piece or a composer and realized that the problem uh, was not with the composer but yourself. <laughs> yes, and I tell that story, in fact, about the very Fauré Sonata I'm playing today. In fact, we're playing today. Um, but then, of course, there are pieces I've heard and I've dismissed and I don't care. They're bad pieces. <laughs> I don't want to hear them again. Oh, what, which pieces are those? <laughs> oh, God. Some awful pieces. I don't care. I'm not going to be fair and give them a second hearing. I don't there want to is waste also a comment life. actually by Schumann on that. Never give bad pieces, you know, That's true. <laughs> too much uh, exposure. Right? You don't want that to fall into the canon. Yeah, he talks about that quite a lot. <laughs> um, but yes, this Foré sonata. I mean, but because I trust Foré, because I love Foré with a, a passion... Um, in fact, my son is named after him, partly, Gabriel, Gabriel. Um, but I never understood this first cello sonata. I, I love the second sonata, but I just didn't understand it. And then I thought, look, I c Foré cannot be at fault here. This must be my, my sort of ignorance, my lack of understanding. So I worked it in and worked at it. And I, I finally, I loved it. But then, and I recorded it. Like in nineteen in the mid nineties, and then um, then I, somebody brought it to me to teach much more recently, just three or four years ago, and suddenly it became completely clear to me. I thought this piece is simple; it's not complicated; it's not weird at all. It's completely simple. Doing that lesson, having already recorded it once, um, then I felt more deeply in love with it. And now, hopefully, Connie and I are recording it next month um, because I want to do it again. And it's, it's funny, you know. Just, and now, actually, I'm working on the string quartet by Foré, that um, I'm director of this seminar down in Cornwall, Prussia Cove. And we do, we have this thing called open chamber music where I work with young musicians for a whole week on a piece. And we worked on the string quartet by Foré, which is the last work. And really, that takes some getting into. And I did it for a week. I didn't want to perform it. It's not ready yet. I'm going to do it again for another week. And then, I'm gonna, then we're going to perform it. Um, you know, but it's like it does seem weird, weird, and this has happened to me with Foray piano quintets as well. And then you open, it's like you open a door and you're inside the piece, and you cannot understand why it seemed complicated or weird before you open that door. Was it a kind of sudden opening for you, or was it like just a kind of gradual? With well, each I said, you know, or? the first sonata, I, I opened it a bit and I did right. love it, but then I somehow opened, yeah. I think, a door to an inner. Thing. Of course, you may hear me play it today and think I don't understand it at all. Or I may fail to make it clear to you, which is even worse. But, I'll, but we'll try. We'll try. And, and Connie plays for a beautifully. So I, I also gather that you had a big problem with Beethoven as well. I mean, I had a problem with Schumann, but you have a problem with Beethoven. Yeah, but the difference yeah. is you're 50 years old and you still have a problem with Schumann. <laughs> At least I got out of my problem with Beethoven. Don't give away my age. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I mean, you're 30 years old. No. Sorry, it's my, my English isn't very good. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I did have a problem with Beethoven. It's weird. Because uh, now my absolute favorite thing to do is the Beethoven cycle with Forte Piano, with Robert Levin on Forte Piano. We've done it, I don't know how many times, the whole cycle, and there's nothing in music I prefer to do than that. And it's, I mean, it's just 
the feeling you get from playing Beethoven is just indescribable. There's nothing like it. The sort of the happiness that fills you, this joy, this triumph. So I, I'm curious what was what the blockage was. I don't know. I can't understand. Again, I've opened that door and I can't understand why I was outside it. Um, for me, it just seems now this, the strength of the spirit in this music is just so inspiring. Um, I don't know. I can't explain it to you. I was an idiot. Okay. <laughs> That's the only way right. I can explain it. I'm not saying I'm not an idiot now, but at least I, <laughs> at least I understand that that I was then. It's a very interesting story. You, you're kind of strangely connected to Beethoven in a kind of funny uh, way, right? Yes. You and your family, because you come over from a very musical family. So it goes back actually to the Soviet Union, and my father had the good sense to be born in 1917 in Odessa which perhaps wasn't the wisest choice. Um, and then nine, my, my grandfather was quite a famous, very famous pianist and composer. And in 1922, Lenin made the decision that 12 Soviet musicians would be allowed to travel abroad with their families for six months and spread the word of this great cultural oasis that was the Soviet Union, which was a great idea of Lenin's, except that not one of the 12 ever went back. Um, including my grandfather. And he was on his way to America, but he stopped in Vienna. And in fact, he gave a couple of concerts there. They were so successful, people said, you should settle in Vienna, which he did. And then he was looking for an apartment, and my father had this vaguest memory of this event. They were looking for an apartment, they went to one, and the Hausfrau showing them around was 102 years old. And apparently she was very nice to my father and ruffled his hair, that was all fine. Until my grandfather said, like, well, we like the apartment, but I'm a musician, I'll have to practice. Is that okay? She said, no, I won't have any musicians. I said, why? I hate musicians. Why? This is Vienna. You hate musicians. Because when I was a little girl, my aunt had a lodger, and he was a filthy old man who used to spit all over the floor, and he was a musician. My grandfather said, well, who was that? Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bizarre connection. But you, you actually have um, many connections. I mean, what other connections does your family, do you have, well, kind of reaching back to all the sort of... Yeah, I'm heritage? related to Mendelssohn. And on my mother's side, I'm related to Lewandowski, who's a famous Jewish composer, Polish Jewish. And then um, my grandfather studied with Taniev, who was the favorite, favorite student of Tchaikovsky. And of course, my grandfather knew Prokofiev and Rachmaninoff and people. Um, Metna was his great friend. Uh, yeah, it's quite a lot, really. It's a lot. So do you mm. ever feel that particular heritage or legacy as you play? I mean, you know, you're, you're sort of in this kind of line. Do you, do you, well, does it connect at all? Is it just all new to you? It's all pretty new. I mean, I do have a particular love for Russian music, it's true, which may come from my, my father was so passionate about it, my grandfather was so passionate about it. Um, but I also have a great love for French music, so that's not, and Czech music. So that's not so explicable. Um, no, but uh, more important for me is that both my sisters were always playing music when I was growing up, and my parents. Right. So there's always a ready interpretation there, actually. A kind of well, there's just a kind if you of grow oral up, tradition, as it were. Yes, oral there. tradition. But also, if you just grow up, you want you see your older sisters doing things uh, well, you want to do and do it you know, as well. And I think in. I remember in the book you, you played chamber music with, yes, with your sisters. I did, and my parents. Right, right. That usually ended in tears, but we did it. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, there, there is a comment by Schumann that says, never miss an opportunity to play with others. Yes. Right? And uh, I, I think it's very easy, especially in Hong Kong, where we live in these sort of small compartments, to sort of be on your own as a musician. So what, what's the benefit? What, what's, the adv what's the meaning of the advice here? Oh, everything. I mean, I, I consider everything chamber music. If I play concerto, it's chamber music, just on a larger scale. But um, I'm glad we sort of seem to be maturing in the music world everywhere, beyond the point where you're either a soloist or a chamber mm. musician. It's ridiculous. Um, every, everybody should play chamber music. And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to play with people who are on your wavelength and communicate. You're communicating on a very high level somehow. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think it's getting better, isn't it, that people do play chamber music, every, almost every 
famous musicians still play chamber music. Sometimes they don't play it very well, but they play it. And even when I was a student, people would say, oh, well, you shouldn't play chamber music. It's bad for your career. I just thought that was rubbish. I remember my great friend Joshua Bell, with whom I've been playing now for 30 years, um, he, he got some advice from his agents. He said, we don't think you should do much chamber music. And he gave them a piece of his mind. <laughs> and he was only about 20-something at the time. And they shut up. It was good. I don't think he's done his career too much harm. He's done okay. <laughs> he's yeah. done okay. <laughs> but, I mean, pl playing chamber music is also, I mean, of course, apart from the listening, uh, you also have to interact with, you know, people <laughs> that yeah, may have a different exactly. understanding of and the music. When you're, unless you're a singer, you stop having lessons. And... Um, you know, when you're about 20 or whatever, or in your 20s. And this is actually a great way of getting feedback from people you can respect. Chain music as well, it's yes. one can learn. Yes. Have musicians that you play with ever changed your mind completely about interpretation of a piece? Completely. Well, not maybe considerably. Considerably, I'm sure they have, yeah. Of course, I mean, when I played with people like Ferenc Radosh, who may not have heard of, but he's he's our great. He's a great musician. He was the teacher of Anders Schiff and others. And um, you know, I learned masses from him. And I hate to say it, but some conductors have helped me too. <laughs> Usually not my favorite people, but like when I played Haydn Concerto for the first time with John Elliott Gardner or Schumann Concerto with Roger Norrington, they did make helpful suggestions. <laughs> Conductors aren't to necessarily my <laughs> <laughs> to say nice things here. <laughs> no, I, I can say nice. I was I'm very grateful for that. Also, in in the book, of course, Schumann is a great advocate for new music. I saw yes. often saying, you know, "Please, you know, have you know, listen out for new composers, new music." And of course, he himself had an own uh, journal that sort of um, promoted new music. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I also realized that you have been uh, commissioning new music and playing a lot of new music. Yes, yeah, not as much as I should. Yes, can you maybe say something about what you know drives you to you know find the right composers and how these things kind of work out for you? Well, I mean, the first thing I should say is that all music should feel like new music. I mean, Beethoven really does feel like new music when you play it. It's just it doesn't age. Really. No, it doesn't yeah. age at all. It feels absolutely different. You have to sort of see it through the eyes of the time and how, like, just playing the C.P. Bach concerto. It's mad. Um, it's wonderful, but it's so eccentric and mad. I, you know, it sounds strange to us even today. I don't know how it must have sounded to, to them then, I suppose. Maybe no stranger. And yeah, composers, it's usually word of mouth, like musicians as well. If I hear somebody say, describe, um, if I hear enough people describe certain musicians in a certain way, it's what they say about them. And I think, oh yeah, that's somebody I could be interested in playing with. Um, and the same with composing, with composers. So Tom Addis, of course, everybody was talking about him and I knew him. We'd even made a CD together of small pieces. And um, so he was the obvious person to ask to write a piece when I was offered by somebody, a commission. Um, and I don't know, and I, get, I know Kurtag very well, so I've worked a lot with him. He's only written me one small piece and he write, may write me another one now. Um, but I've worked on many of his pieces he's written in the past. And who else have I played? I mean, some John Taverner, just because I heard my sister, Rachel, who's a violinist, I have two sisters, Annette's a violist and Rachel's a violinist. She just was playing some piece by John Taverner and she said, and she said he's Russian Orthodox. He writes in the Russian Orthodox style because I've always loved Russian Orthodox music. And she said he came to rehearsal and somehow I think you and he would get on. So... It was at a time when I had very little work. I was sort of getting snow blindness looking at my diary. Um, <laughs> so I thought I could do with a project. So I called his publisher, whom I knew. I said, do you think he'd write a 10-minute piece for cello and small string ensemble? And she said, well, call him up and ask him. So I did. She gave me his number, and I called him. And we talked about Russian Orthodox music, and I said how much I loved the Tsunamini chants, which was slightly dishonest, because I wouldn't know a Tsunamini chant from an elephant in a striped pyjamas, but I'd read that those were the most authentic Orthodox chants. You know, I love all the, all the Orthodox music I've heard, whether it's Tsunamini or not. Anyway, he liked that. He liked the fact I didn't just talk about a cello concerto and things. And I said, uh, I said um, do you think you could write this 10-minute piece for cello and just maybe single strings or small stringer? Yeah. 
yes, I think I could do that. And then before I knew it, well before anybody was commissioning it or whatever, which you can't do, you're not meant to write a note till it's been commissioned, this score arrived at this 42-minute piece for cello and vast string orchestra. So that was... It was good. I often it was think it's a good piece. It's a <laughs> it, made, it made a big splash. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece, the protecting veil. Yeah, I love yeah, it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I w- often wonder how dear Belly must have felt. He sent this little theme to Beethoven and asked for one variation. On exactly. It, and he got the dear Belly variations. <laughs> I'm glad you did that with uh, with John Taverner. Um, now you're playing a very, uh, as I said, an unusual program this evening and also you do give advice into young this musicians. This afternoon, isn't uh, this, it? Yes, this afternoon. You do give some advice in, in this book about um, careful programming. Mm, it's important. It's very important. And I remember actually even as a, as a professor, you know, even when uh, the students are playing the pieces, actually the program counts, not just their performance. Because Absolutely. How you choose that program is very important. Mm. So I'm interested how you chose your program. For today? Yes. Well, it's actually, it's unusual. Normally I have a, a musical link, but this is actually extra musical. It's Marcel Proust, which is sounds a bit sooty. But, um, but he was, you know, he, I'm not sure about his writing about music. I, after Tom Addis wrote this piece, which you can tell from the title, is somewhat inspired by Proust. Um, I actually knuckled down and read Proust. Took me eighteen months. All seven volumes of <laughs> twelve volumes. Twelve oh. volumes. Well, yes, I can't say it was easy, but some of it's <laughs> wonderful. I mean, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a fanatic like some people. Like my friend Jeremy Denk, the pianist, who I think has read it four times complete. Um, but, but it's, some of it's well, some of it's so funny. I mean, he just sees he has this X-ray vision through people, which I would love to write a. And not that I do it anything like as well, but I'd love to write a description of a musical rehearsal in the style of Proust, because he just sees everybody's motive for saying everything they say. And as I say, it can be hilarious. Um, anyway, so, but he does write about music in his very individual way. I mean, it's obviously a non-musician writing, but, but it is, it's powerful. So I just thought he certainly cared a lot about music. And I knew all these pieces, and I thought, hang on, this is a Proust program. Because around the Addis, I mean, Ronaldo Hahn was Proust's partner when they were young. And that's, the fir- that's the first piece, that's the first which you piece, had to dig out, right? Which you I had, had to, to dig f- out, took ages to find. I was very pleased when I found it. Um, and then the Foré, Proust wrote Foré a letter, a famous letter in which he says, I love your music so much, I would like to write a 300-page book about it. Which he didn't, sadly, but <laughs> I wish he had. And then there's the Addis, and then Saint-Saëns, who Proust was, I think, unfairly critical of Saint-Saëns, but he admitted that the famous violin sonata in Swan in Love was based on Saint-Saëns. And then César Franck, whom Proust adored, and by the end of his life he was only listening to Beethoven and Franck, and he famously got this unfortunate quartet. He sort of sent a car around for them at two o'clock in the morning with a dish of mashed potatoes for each of them and said, you have to come and play me the César Franck Quartet. So they had to go, like, they arrived at three in the morning and they played it to him and he had his eyes shut. And it's an hour long. And then he said, play it again. <laughs> so anyway, he adored Franck. So. so in a way, this program also kind of you know, chimes in with your own kind of tastes as well because you also adore Fauré and I Beethoven do. like like Proust yes, so there is a right. kind of similar sensibility there somewhere I suppose I don't feel much in common with Marcel Proust he was <laughs> a most extraordinary being a creature from an, another planet but um, I've read the book by his housekeeper which is just <laughs> mind boggling um, he was so odd but yeah I like I, mean, I like to have an idea behind a program So, you know, whatever, whether it be the Beethoven cycle or this Proust thing or, you know, it's a Russian program or Czech program. Mm. I like to sort of tell one story throughout a whole concert. Right. Well, I I bought some Madeleines because, Ah, you see, see this this is um, Proust's favorite um, bakery, uh, sort of a French cake. 
And uh, he talks about it a lot, right? He does. <laughs> but the smell, does. you can smell this. Well, it's biting into it, the dunking smell of the mandolin, into it. Yes. So yes. you can have this before your concert. So Thank you to, very much. To get you no, my, into the Proust mm, uh, mood. And my tempo will be slower. <laughs> for this. Now, I think we have some time for questions. And I would like particularly the, the young musicians. But yeah, Everybody here is young. Yeah, well, yeah, compared to me. Except right? you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's young. Uh, since I'm the benchmark here for old. So, um, uh, so it, it, anybody needs any advice? You know, a young musician here needs some advice, please put up your hand, or even if you are young at heart. Any uh, question. Uh, any question is fine. Uh, yeah. So there's a question. You mentioned we shouldn't learn a piece from other records, etc., but that's pretty much how I do it. Sometimes, like mm. different people. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so, no. Um, I mean, when you're very young, you're bound to be inspired by listening to recordings of your favorite musicians. But once you really get to study seriously, no, don't listen to all these different interpreters. As I put it in the book, you know, you have the score there. So why go to another interpreter? It's like you go to your local vicar instead of going to God. You know, God is there waiting to talk to you. And you say, oh, not interested in you. Um, Vicar, what do you think God means when he says? Um, no, but you have to, I'd say, just look at every marking. And he also, Schumann says, you have to understand the form of a piece before you can understand the meaning. And he's absolutely right. It's like, you know, if you don't know what the first, second, third subjects are, say, of a sonata movement, it's like reading a novel without knowing who the main characters are. You have to know what happens to them, which is you know how the themes develop, how they interact. Um, so yeah, I mean it's very important not. I mean, cello students, of course, I have a slight problem because of course I want them to buy my recordings, but I said buy my recordings, don't listen to them. <laughs> then we're both happy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean it's. The composer is really waiting to tell you. But then, of course, also important, you have to have the right edition. So you really do get, again, the vicar hasn't got in the way, hasn't put it their interpretation. I, I have seen, I've just been in Korea, and some of the young cellists bought me the, the editions they were playing. I said, don't use this edition. It's completely distorted what the composer said. And that's quite a lot of detective work, because you can't even trust an Urtex edition. Like, for instance, Baron Reiter Schubert is, to me, criminal. It's terrible. Um, you have to really check that you're doing what the composer wrote. Um, and then they will talk to you. And other interpretations will just get in the way. There'll just be voices in your head when there should be only one voice in your head, and that's the composer, I would say. Right, we, we're going, uh, you, you said uh, Schumann asked us to look at the, the music. So, uh, sorry, I bought your Bach suite and I listened to it. Um, hey. Oh, you're a cellist? Uh, I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> you would know better than I would. <laughs> All right, well, I forgive you for that. That's fair enough. Then what's your view on the, the uh, Anna's Boeings? You, you're not paying those uh, no. like, like oh. Anna Bilsma did. Oh, I know Anna did. He's such a, I love Anna Bilsma, but he's so eccentric and so extreme. It's fun. I went for lunch with him a couple of years ago in Amsterdam, and we just argued, 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 argued for <laughs> hours all through lunch. And at the end, he said, thank you for coming to see me, Stephen. I always like to talk to people who agree with everything I say. <laughs> 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 so cute. Um, no, I don't think they're to be taken literally. But again, there are messages there. I think she makes a big mistake in bar one of the prelude at the first suite, which is sort of symptomatic. Um, I cannot understand why her very first slur is there. I'm sure it's a mistake. Um, she was in a hurry. Had a lot of children to look after and singing and everything. Um, and if you compare her copy of the violin sonatas and partitas with her husband's, there's a lot of differences. And really, they're mostly mistakes on her side. Um, but again, as I say, I, I play from them and interpret them. But also, I look at the Kellner, which is possibly earlier copy, and that's very interesting too, and very different. It's so different that they're almost certainly copying from different copies of the suites. Um, but no, you have to be a detective for the Bach suites and try and decide what really makes sense. Everything in this suites is completely logical, makes sense. Then, then you really have a big argue with 
and the Vishma then. I do. But he's being very eccentric. He's, he loves arguments. He loves to be extreme. I'm sure he knows. He it's not. Uh, win you all for them. <laughs> no. I don't think he even believes it. And deep down, you can't believe it because there's so many mistakes and the wrong notes. So why shouldn't there be wrong bowings? Um, yes, I'm doing, trying to do it now. <laughs> I think you, again, that's slightly. If it was Bach manuscript, yes, I would be. I'm much more loath to dismiss it, but I think there's some things in Anna Magdalena that are just wrong. And she would have said, oh, God, sorry, and changed them. Um, but... We are on, your, on our own then. <laughs> oh, that's a bit terrifying. Um, yeah, we're sort of on our own. We have to be detectives. I don't feel we're on our own. But we no, the composer is there trying to help us. Um, but unfortunately, in the Bach, case of the Bach Suites, the composer isn't there because we don't have a manuscript of Bach's own in Bach's own hand. So we have to be detectives there. And I should say, you know, as you know, musicologists, academic, we always disagree with each other anyway when we're looking at these things. So it's a community of, uh, of people trying to get to grips with these works, right? And in the end, you are in that community uh, negotiating, you know, yeah. creating these works. And I think that's the healthiest way of doing things. I think we can have um, uh, one, more, one more question. Yeah, one more question. Is there another one? My question may be the last question then, up to yeah, Professor It better Spanish be a good one, yeah, okay. Uh, try to be. <laughs> I'm not a cellist and know nothing about the CDGA, know nothing about your, your, your instrument, um, but uh, just read about uh, one of the interviews you done with the Financial Times last month, I suppose in September. Yes. And just now you talk, also mentioned about the music is music and, um, well, but uh, in your, your interview, uh, at least the published uh, passages, you taught uh, um, music and politics, should be separate. Ideally, and, uh, it can't yeah. be. Always. <laughs> and, and to me, I think the chalice uh, in the world uh, carry a lot of uh, personalities like uh, Casal and, of course, Ross Rupovich. And they are on very much touching on the, um, uh, on the verge of uh, politics. Well, they or had to. Human, humanitarian. I mean, Maybe they, yeah. get, they, compare, they were compelled to do exactly. so. Exactly. And also what uh, famous is uh, Yoyo Ma is working on the, not necessarily on the project side, but uh, on, the, um, on the cultural side, the, his yeah. zero projects. So that's what to me, uh, how far the music can go on, in terms of, um, you know, um, uh, on the humanitarian side or? Well, for me, music is a force, great music is a force for good. And therefore, you know, if you go, I went to the Soviet Union in 1984 and I just felt this incredible, these incredible audiences. There was so much communication between us. Um, you know, and I, it wasn't a political thing to go. I wanted to go. I wanted to see the country where my father was born. Um, you know, that's what it's all about. Kazals and Rostopovich are very different cases. I think Kazals wasn't that political until he was 60 and he was exiled from his homeland. Rostopovich was always a politician. Um, but again, he didn't really speak out until just before he was exiled. And then they have no choice. Um, but, yeah, I mean, when you go around communicating with people without words, that's, as I say, that's a way of, of conveying something that I suppose you could say it was a political, a politically good, it was a sort of a way of like, oh, I think I talked in the interview about the 1968 concert where where the Russian state orchestra with Rostopovich were playing at the Albert Hall at the proms just after the Russians had walked into Czechoslovakia and been so brutal. And everybody who was there talks about how they felt from Rostopovich and the orchestra. This thing is, you know, don't judge us, it's not us. We don't believe that, we're humans too. He was playing Dvorak of all music. Um, everybody remembers that so powerfully. And yeah, it's a unifying thing, music. Um, but I don't think it should be used specifically f for politics. I don't think I'd play for a specific political party. Um, I wouldn't even play for Donald Trump. That's where he loves foray. I mean, he's just <laughs> always going on about foray. <laughs> but I think that's really the difference to him and Hillary, that she loves late foray, he loves eight early foray, but it's too sensitive <laughs> for them to talk about. <laughs> Build a wall between the two forays. <laughs> yes. All right, on that note, well, I, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but thank you so much Hello. for sharing with us, and we look forward to your concert. <laughs> thank you.